much data as possible. There was a wonderful program that America's chief scientist in Antarctica, Harry Wexler, proposed, which was the Antarctic Weather Central. He wanted everybody, especially, to cooperate on not only reporting on the weather, but analyzing it. The Russians, they said, well, OK, we want to be there. And Wexler was smart enough to say, how about we bring a meteorologist to Mirny? And at length, that happened. And it was, it was a wonderful melting uh, of that uh, Cold War. They collected all the data. I hand-keyed circuits. And we would convert five number code groups in uh, International Weather Code to weather symbols and plot them by hand on the map. Then the uh, analysts would try to connect them up with the uh, isobars, equal lines of pressure, and figure out where the highs and lows were and uh, which way they were moving so they could make a forecast. While wintering at Bird Station, a Russian weather exchange scientist had a stomach ulcer deemed critical. Admiral Tyree dispatched the first U.S. medical evacuation during the winter. On April 10, 1961, LC-130 number 321, piloted by Commander Lloyd Newcomer, departed Christchurch and landed at Bird Station in the few hours of dim light available. Flying in the Antarctic winter was proven possible. But for every success, Antarctica balances the scales. That November, a P-2V carrying seven Navy crew and a geophysicist departed McMurdo for a 3,500-mile aerial survey of East Antarctica. They landed near Wilkes Station to overnight. Australian geophysicist Bill Birch and a Navy crewman stayed to refuel the plane from 55-gallon drums. All we had was a hand pump, so it was a very tedious task made all the more frustrating because as we pumped up into the belly of the plane, Fuel seemed to be streaming out from some drain hole in the rear. Normal spillage, my companion assured me. Seconds after liftoff, the fuselage exploded into flame and the P2V crashed into the snow. Knowing where most of the crew had been sitting, it was obvious where they should be, and led by the faint, sweet, sweet, sickly smell of badly burned flesh, we found a jumbled mass of almost unrecognizable bodies. LC-130, number 321, arrived days later to pick up the survivors and the remains.